What have we got here? Leon is back, baby. Welcome everyone to the Leon B scenario part of my four part Resident Evil 2 classic long form analysis. As you likely already know if you're watching this, I've never played the Resident Evil games before, so I've been going through them in order and making videos about each one so others can join me on this journey, a modern look at the allegedly classic franchise. Before getting started though, if you are new here, you should definitely watch my videos on Leon A and Claire A before getting into this one. One. and if you really care, you should probably watch my videos on Remake as well, as they're all referenced in some way here. All of these are linked in cards up above and in the description below. All of that said, let's get into Leon B. There's a lot to talk about. In the midst of the T-Virus outbreak in Raccoon City, the narrator begins, revealing how Claire and Sherry were some of the city's only survivors. He states that the reasoning for their survival was thanks to the Raccoon City Police Department's only surviving officer, none other than our Leon Scott Kennedy. It's time to find out how Mr. Kennedy was the reason for Claire and Sherry's escape. Already, that sounds like more of a mission than Leon's A scenario, where the man was just running around for seemingly no reason before stumbling into everything that's going on, so I'm on board with this. The scene transitions to Leon driving his jeep into town for his first day of work, stopping near a gas station after seeing a dead body on the road. We get a quick glimpse of the bitten semi-driver while Leon investigates, and to our hero's dismay, he turns to find himself surrounded by the undead. What was that? What are these things? After unloading his pistol and commenting that his clean shots aren't doing anything, Leon backs into an alley only to find Claire burst out of a nearby building. We relive the hilariously timed Wait! Don't shoot! Get down! scene before the two race away in a nearby police car and get ambushed by the zombie inside, which leads us to my first correction for this video. In Leon's A scenario, you'll notice that the car spins around before crashing into the pole and the two get separated. In Claire's A scenario, I commented on how strange it was that Claire started on the same side as Leon without realizing that the car doesn't spin in her playthrough, which explains why they would get out on the same side in both A playthroughs. Since I'm playing Leon B now, which is a continuation of Claire A, the car once again fails to spin, and this explains exactly why Leon is suddenly on a new side of town once we get our hands on him. At the same time, at the same place, you have to survive this nightmare to know the true end, the game reads. Damn, this must have been so cool to experience at release. Not only are you promised a greatly improved upon survival horror experience from the first game, but Resident Evil 2 presents two alternative campaigns as well, quite literally doubling down on the amount of content offered by the original. As one of the many kids out there who would only get a few games year due to, you know, not having financial autonomy, I would have been so hyped for this after reading that text. Four different playthroughs, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about the hypothetical experience. But while I'm geeking out about potential great value, Leon is fending off zombies on this never before seen side of town. I appreciate that from the very start of Leon's B scenario, things are very different from Claire's A scenario. This shows a commitment to the new style, and it's very easy for me to get on board. It's Capcom showing us that a B scenario is more than just just a few new lines of dialogue and a couple of extra areas. This is about to be a whole new campaign. The street leads us to the station's parking lot, which I have also not seen before, and we find a cabin key in the parking attendant's seating area. After examining the garage door nearby, I realize that this is the other end of that gate down by where Ada and Leon push the van away. A neat environmental detail for sure. The cabin key places us in that room where Claire found the bow gun. In fact, we enter through the door that was blocked off for Claire by zombies. Zombies that I used to test the bowgun and grenade launcher with the one that somehow survived their legs being blown off and surprise attacked me, if you remember. There's no bowgun for Leon, though I wonder if there would be if Claire didn't grab it, but instead there's some pistol rounds and a save point. We maneuver through the nearby courtyard and head upstairs to our first new cutscene, a police officer yelling to a helicopter for assistance. The chopper starts lowering a ladder towards him, but not before the zombies catch up to our new friend. The cop backs himself into a corner and fails to mow the zombies down with his assault rifle, instead hitting the chopper pilot as they take him down, which I don't think Claire hears in her A scenario. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why the helicopter crashes down and blocks the way to Iron's office and the art room on the second floor, all because a cop couldn't aim his weapon at the zombies' heads. That aside, I wonder if Claire will put out the fire for us, since Leon B is meant to occur alongside Claire A, and she's the one who did it in her A scenario. Now it's time to enter the station. So, not only does Leon B 
arrive at the station through the back way instead of the front, but he makes it inside on the second floor instead of the first, marking a completely opposite entrance from both Claire and Leon A, who just walk in the front door in their respective scenarios. Inside, I stand off with the crows that Claire used her bowgun on, and I wish I had the same option here. I wait to see if they'll make the first move, and after realizing this was wishful thinking, I attack. After hitting just one crow, they're on me and doing damage, causing me to use my first heal in less than 15 minutes of playtime. I probably would have been more successful here if I tried running through them instead of fighting, but everything is clear in retrospect. Leon and I barge through the closest door to find that stairwell outside the office with all the officers' desks, and restore my stash of the legendary green herb before re-entering on the second floor. Fortunately, the crows are back where they spawn, and we dash the other way to find ourselves in the hallway on the other side of the crashed helicopter. But we can't relax just yet. Instead of experiencing an emergent gameplay moment as Claire did at this point, we're faced with the much less enjoyable liquor for the first time in Leon B. I gun it down while taking a hit only to realize there's a second one down the hall. This thing almost destroys me as I'm slow to aim at the ground with my pistol when it's up close, readjusting to the tank controls and all that, but I do end up barely winning. And there goes my next green herb. This early on, I fought a set of zombies, some crows, and two liquors with just my pistol. In both A scenarios, we've only fought smaller hordes of zombies by this point. Nothing super crazy until that first liquor in the side halls, and even then, that's only one liquor. This influx in both the amount and the variety of enemies are making it clear that the B scenario is not only different than A, but more challenging than A. We enter the first safe room in Iron's secretary's office, uncover secretary's diary A about moving the statues around, and progress into the second floor of the station's main lobby. My only plan right now is to see what areas are open to me immediately. Knowing that the ladder is here, we lower it for future use and head around the balcony to find the unicorn metal stuck in a crevice towards its end, a spot where no other item has appeared yet and a stark contrast from its hiding place in the star's office during the A scenarios. With the library door locked, I make my descent to use the unicorn metal and acquire the spade precinct key. While I can't unlock the doors electronically as I'm missing a key card from that dying cop, there's a convenient shotgun on the receptionist's desk, so not all is lost. This leads me to wonder if Leon will find the grenade launcher or any of Claire's weapons, or if he'll just have the same ones from his A scenario. It would definitely make sense if Leon didn't find Claire's weapons, since we'd assume Claire would have them all, but hey, who knows? Maybe there will be some leeway for the sake of fun. Also, what the hell is that face on the computer monitor here? What kind of receptionist has this sitting on their desktop? I check out the front entrance just because I can, but there's nothing to be found besides a few zombies. At least, not that I could uncover. It would have been cool to find a rare weapon or some ammo as a reward for adventuring out here, but oh well. Since nothing else is open down here, I head back upstairs only to go right back down via the side stairwell into the office. Inside, we find a squad's worth of zombies and the valve handle of all things. Not sure why it would be in here instead of the shed with the bow gun like in the A scenarios. Are item placements going to be more arbitrary this time? I can't think of any journal entries or other details that would reveal why this is in here, but I guess this also means we'll be putting the chopper fire out and not Claire. Also, you may remember that in Claire's A scenario, you're entering this office much later on. By that point, most of these zombies have already been wiped, and I find that to be a neat touch because it makes sense that Leon was in here earlier than Claire was and he would have cleared out some of the zombies by the time she arrives. Both scenarios do have this hidden green herb behind the desk though. The next room marks the first situation that requires Leon's shotgun, as there is a horde of zombies to fight off that spawn right outside the door. There's always an alarming amount of zombies out here, but this is the most by far, and such problems require special solutions. <laughs> I check on the first half of the interrogation room before heading back upstairs to put out the fire, only to find a liquor awaiting me, which was not the case in any A scenarios. I came in so unprepared for this that I experienced my first of quite a few deaths as Leon B. My comeback though was much stronger, as I was able to dodge the hallway zombies and take them out one by one with my pistol, and saved my shotgun ammo for that liquor. I stand sturdy at the door and land a hit on the ceiling, though he does get a hit on me before I finish him off. There are only a few handgun bullets inside, so it was kind of a sad trade too, but maybe it means I won't get ambushed on the other side of the mirror later. I navigate back upstairs and run past the crows to put out the helicopter fire, only to be interrupted by an umbrella branded helicopter carrying a collection of tanks. One drops down and... Holy shit, guys, it's Mr. X, it's him. 
I've been waiting for him. Could this be what Irons is referencing in Claire A about the monster that's sent to eliminate all evidence? It must be, right? And of course, since Capcom wants to make us suffer, Mr. X has dropped right into the hallway I was about to enter. I walk inside anyways, because I have nowhere else to go. The ceiling crashes down behind me, preventing any hope for escape, as I proceed in a silence that's truly deafening. Just as I turn one corner, a hulking monstrosity turns the other. The music blasts, and I don't even try to fight. I've heard he's invincible, so what's the point? Leon gets clotheslined as we attempt to run by, but I get through as Mr. X winds up a smash. Even the crows have fled though, so if there's one thing to be happy about here, it's that I didn't waste ammo on them. I escape into the art room in hopes that Tyrannos will protect me, but instead I find a blue keycard that I can't even carry. Knowing this item's importance, I sacrifice a green herb at close to full health to grab it, but as if I wasn't shaken enough, a liquor smashes through the ceiling to keep me on edge. With only two shotgun shells left, I fire once to stun it and switch to my pistol to finish it off without a scratch. No matter my fear levels, I've got to keep a level head if I want to save ammo. Lamenting that I can't grab these extra shotgun shells, I head back to the main lobby to open the locked doors with my new keycard and get on with my journey. So far, I've explored much of the second floor and hardly any of the first, a notable contrast from the A scenarios at this point. I appreciate the shift in content order as it serves to keep things fresh on subsequent playthroughs while testing the player's knowledge of the station layout. Speaking of testing my knowledge, I certainly don't remember zombies in this safe room, but here they are. I guess we really can't have anything nice in a B scenario playthrough. Granted, there's only two slow walkers in here, but does this mean safe rooms are no longer safe? It's zombies for now, but will it be Mr. X later? I remember Polygon spoiling the fact that Mr. X can break into a safe room in RE2 Remake, and is that a new idea, or did it come from here? Okay, I can't focus on this right now, I need to breathe and keep moving. The police memorandum note in here reveals the safe code in that other office to be 2236, and it was here I realized that this code is the same in every playthrough, and I should really have it memorized by now. That said, I finally found some shotgun shells in a locked desk nearby, so overall this room is a win. Back in the hallway, you might notice that there's no liquor this time around, despite there being a pile of blood, which I assume is from Claire's fight with the creature. It's interesting to examine what Capcom considered changing from an A to B scenario and what they didn't. For example, Claire puts out the chopper fire in her A scenario, but Leon still has to do it here. Yet, when Claire enters the police office in her A scenario, most of the zombies are already dead thanks to Leon's involvement in his B scenario, or here the liquor is gone thanks to Claire fighting it off in her A scenario. There are many other overlaps and changes as the campaign goes on, but I think it's pretty cool that they're varied. I think expecting a one-to-one -one comparison between an A and a B scenario would have been too much to ask for. Capcom would have had to spend loads of time creating brand new puzzles for a B scenario compared to the A one if they carried every single moment over over. Almost an entire other game's worth, really. Like, yeah, it would have been interesting to have all of Claire's A scenario actions carry over and see Leon just roaming through the station in tandem in his B scenario to uncover a few extra story beats. Instead of Leon putting out the fire or unlocking doors that Claire would have already dealt with, we'd play him finding out some extra facts about irons in the B scenario specific areas instead. But I think having a full campaign with some overlap was the better option. It's more time to spend with our resident heroes. At my my command, Mr. Kennedy uses up the spade key to get into the document storage room and finds a first aid spray on top of the cabinets rather than the crank like usual. From here, we move through the west side hallway to enter the operations room and light the fireplace to melt the painting. I expected a different item here, but to my surprise and slight disappointment, it was the red jewel once again. If I'm not mistaken, this is the first important item that hasn't changed locations in Leon's B scenario, and I'm a little bummed by that. I know I just said I didn't need everything to change up in a B scenario, but since key sections like the intro and initial items like the unicorn metal had changed positions, I figured that another key item like the red jewel would have shifted as well. Does this mean the chest piece plugs will remain in the same spot? Are there even chest piece plugs this time around? There's a lot to consider here. But while that thought ruminates in the back of our minds, Leon makes his way up the stairwell above the safe room that looks like the one from the first game and comes across Tyrannos' second red gem, also unmoved. He remembers his experience from Leon A and solves the puzzle quite quickly while I take the time to read the statue description to see if it may have changed from an A scenario. It didn't. I'm keeping a tight inventory here with one first aid spray, my ammo and weapons, and both red gems as I want to clear Tyrannos as fast as possible. But first, let's take a quick peek at the star's office to see how it's doing this playthrough. We find Chris's diary once again and give it a peek, but otherwise there's actually nothing new to see. We enter the next room down the hall to find Sherry of all people. Hey! Wait!
She quickly crawls away through a hole in the floor and drops the diamond precinct key, which I have to use a first aid spray at full health to grab. And just afterward, Claire walks in as she did in her ace scenario. And it's at this point I owe Leon a bit of an apology. In my Claire A video, I roasted Leon for being like, Yeah, you just missed her. Very casually, as if he didn't care that a little girl was roaming around the station alone. But now that we've seen things from his perspective, he did try to stop her, so I better give him some credit. What I'm still confused about, however, is that Leon can just walk in this door that was locked for Claire. It's not like he turned around and locked it, and Sherry went through the vent on the floor, so she didn't have anything to do with it either. Otherwise, the conversation plays out just as it did in Claire A, where he gives her the radio, and we go our separate ways. Our way is to the library, and here's the same puzzle as previous scenarios, which nets us one of the chess piece plugs, but I can't grab it because, in all the commotion, I forgot to bring the red jewels back to Tyrannos and clear out my inventory. I go manage that with little resistance and appreciate the fact that there's no liquor this time. Though I had initially thought I heard something creeping around, but it was just Leon walking around on the glass. These sound effects do a fantastic job of establishing an unsettling atmosphere. With an inventory slot open, I grab the bishop plug from the library and fill it right back up again. I peek the attic really quick to see if any items have been relocated there and take a second to think about my next steps. I haven't found any maps yet, so none of the doors on my map are color coded, which means I don't know where this diamond key is useful yet. I guess I can look at which doors I haven't opened and hope this one fits in, so that's what I go about doing. The closest of these doors is through the west wing and near the stair-covered safe room into another file storage room near where our dying cop friend is. But holy hell, this place got infested with zombies climbing through the windows. Fortunately for my ammo supply, most of the zombies gathered in the corner by the stairs, so I was able to run by without much issue. I'm sure I'll have to deal with them later though. It's eerily silent in here. I feel like there's usually a horde of zombies to fight off in other scenarios, but I guess not this time. I enter the room with Leon's would-be desk had it not been for this traumatic situation and fend off another set of cop zombies along the way. Poor Leon has to kill his co-workers before even having met them. Though, at least he never had to form an emotional connection with any of them. But all of these B-scenario cop zombies everywhere means it's much harder for me to conserve ammo, the hardest it has been in any playthrough so far. Just like in Leon A, the heart key is in the room with our dead cop friend. Unlike in Leon A, we didn't get to meet him this time around. On the bright side, I said no to a couple of pickups in here in anticipation of there being something important, so I was able to grab this heart key without an inventory issue for once. With this latest precinct key in hand, I moved to the first floor office with the safe and opened it up for my first precinct map of this scenario. The map reveals a heart key door in the next room over, which leads us into the east wing hallway and down the steps near the sewers and the parking garage. I tread carefully into the T-shaped hallway, expecting a dog ambush like in Leon A, but come face to face with some low-level zombies instead. A welcome change. We enter the parking garage only to get shot at from behind. <coughs> hmm. This seems familiar. Ah, Ada. How could one forget you firing at us thinking we were a zombie? The same cutscene as Leon A plays where Ada reveals that she's looking for Ben and needs help moving the truck. Leon, being the gentleman he is, helps her out of course. And I should note that at this point, we haven't seen Mr. X since his reveal. I wonder if he'll be the one to take out Ben this time, or if he'll get involved in some other story scenario. We approach Ben and the cutscene plays out as usual with Leon being blatantly rude to him. Let me guess, you must be Ben, right? Get up, now. I've actually softened on this a bit since criticizing it in my Leon A video. I get it, Leon's a cop and the dude is in a jail cell, so he probably thinks Ben is a criminal and to some, such as Chief Irons, he may as well be. Ada arrives late somehow, just like last time. Ben tells us to go into the sewers to escape and into the sewers we descend, right into the sewers with my least favorite enemies in the game. Leon's shotgun makes quick work of the spiders, I put away the chest plugs in the nearby safe room, realize the next room is where the chest plugs go, hate myself for this mistake, and leave to rectify it when we're interrupted by the swap to Ada. While the cutscene that plays is the same as before, what's different here is Sherry's appearance at the start of Ada's section. The two don't even interact, but Sherry drops a medallion containing a photo that I assume is her, Annette, and William. Ada notes that she'll hold on to the medallion for Sherry, and we proceed only to experience the longest lunge I've seen a zombie take at one of my characters. This MF hones in on Ada, which was a shock, but I guess it's okay because she kicks his head in shortly afterward. Also, seeing Sherry was interesting because now I have some context for that elevator I complained about in my Leon A video. Remember I said that this elevator was useless for Ada's area? Well, that's the area Sherry comes through in Claire A, and it's certainly how she leaves after running away from Ada as well. Otherwise, Ada and I solve the box puzzle even though Sherry does it in Claire A, which takes place alongside this, and we acquire the final precinct key. 
the club key. We throw our collectibles back to Leon, and before swapping back to our favorite officer, he gets a radio from Claire, who reveals that she cleared the wreckage that was blocking the corridor. Our map pops up and marks the way to Iron's office as our next step. As you can imagine, this gets my mind racing. Irons doesn't appear in Leon's A scenario. He's only referenced in notes and Ben's rant. Is Leon going to actually meet his would-be boss this time around? I swap the precinct keys for the chess piece plugs, throw them in the nearby door, then head back to the station to find out. Along the way, I'm ambushed in the parking lot by those dogs that were suspiciously absent from the underground hallways. Much like the interrogation room, the parking garage has always been empty in my previous playthrough, so the last thing I was expecting was zombie dogs in here. I can just imagine the team at Capcom laughing their asses off at the thought of trolling players by moving these dogs around. Leon already wasn't feeling great, and the dogs brought him to a dangerous status while using up a few shotgun rounds, but thanks to Ada throwing us some extra, there's more than enough left to feel comfortable. We restore the downstairs power and get ambushed by liquors in the room with the coffers, a far cry from the usual zombie ambush that occurs after grabbing the keycard, but this is nothing a few shotgun blasts can't fix. Since there are already coffers on the ground, I wonder if Claire was already in here. Then again, if that were the case, she'd have grabbed this key card and the weapon room would have been unlocked, so I guess I've got to suspend my disbelief a little bit. Inside the weapon room, I realize I've put myself in a bit of a conundrum. In both A scenarios, this room offers a side pack inventory extension and a submachine gun for the character you're playing as. You can choose to take one, both, or neither, leaving the items for the next character's B scenario. In Leon A, I took both, which I'll deal with come Claire B. But in Claire A, I took the side pack and left the submachine gun thinking I'd be nice to my future self in Leon B. Those are good intentions bit me in the ass. See, the submachine gun takes up two inventory slots. Without the side pack, you probably won't have two inventory slots to spare due to the sheer number of necessary items at this point in the game. So by only taking the side pack as Claire and leaving the submachine gun to Leon who can't even hold it, I essentially got the worst of both worlds. Sure, I could trade out my pistol and pistol ammo for the submachine gun, but you can't find ammo for this gun, so I don't want to waste it on random zombies and have it just sitting in my inventory. I only want it for tough boss fights. All that said, after much consideration, I end up leaving the submachine gun while cursing my past self for not thinking harder about this. Good play, Capcom. This room also has some magnum bullets, which is a gun I don't even have yet, so we'll keep those handy for later. Honestly, I expected Mr. X to show around now, since I could have acquired a new weapon at this point, but I was wrong once again, and I'm really tensing up waiting for this man to appear, but I'm pretty sure that's exactly how they want me to feel. I take out a load of newly arrived zombies upstairs, acquire the Watchman's Diary and some more magnum rounds in the bunk room, and notice something a little odd about the weapon and ammo names. If you spell them out, the terms magnum bullets and shotgun shells are each 13 letters, but the inventory shortens magnum bullets to M bullets, yet it leaves shotgun shells as is. I'm fortunate enough to work in games now, and while this obviously doesn't matter in the long run, if I committed this grammatical error myself and it ended up in the final product, it would have eaten at me for the rest of my life. We have a few more keys to get rid of back on the east side of the station, starting with the final diamond key door, the other interrogation room. In here is a rook plug, which I will happily trade a diamond key for, and, more importantly, no liquor jumping through the glass. Next is the fire puzzle in the press room, which nabs me the gear, and just as I move to grab it, boom! Mr. X storms through the wall, which is not okay. Thankfully, a desk stands in between us, and I run the other way only for mans to storm through another wall just as I thought I was safe. It makes sense that the initial crash was so easy to escape from then, as you're meant to feel confident in having run away, only for Mr. X to scare that thought right out of your head. Leon takes two hits here, but we get around Mr. X once again as he winds up as Smash, which I assume is the case for most players of this game. Now we've got two things on our to-do list. One, find the crank for the attic since I have the gear for it, and two, check out Iron's office. My curiosity for the latter has to be satiated, so I start with Iron's. By the time we arrive here, he's already gone, which actually makes sense based on Claire A, but his diary is here. So continues Leon's lack of meaning his boss, and only reading about what a terrible person he is. A skin nothing short of perfection. We then enter the glass display area where Claire and Sherry had a moment in her scenario and also when she radios Leon after the Ada section. If you remember, this is also when I was expecting Mr. X to appear in Claire A since there are so many destructive items placed conveniently around. 
Instead, we find the crank in the nearby chest, which is a very welcome discovery. It's off to the attic then, where I assume I'll find the final chest piece plug, but the game has other plans for me. Right when I interact with the door back into the hallway, the music takes a dramatic shift for the worst. While Mr. X didn't appear in the display room like I predicted, he does show up in a narrow hallway with no way for me to run around him. In retrospect, this hallway is certainly the smarter place to put him, as I would have just ran around the monster in the display room. I actually try fighting him a little bit this time, but to no avail. Leon's nemesis simply shrugs off every shot I fire, though we're able to slide past him in a spot that didn't look possible, but hey, I'll take it. I do wish that the game didn't ruin Mr. X's arrival with the music so early. Imagine how tense it would have been if I stepped into the hallway and it was silent, only for the beast to attack right as I turned the corner. After escaping, we use the crank in the attic, place the gear on the switch, and acquire the final chess piece plug before heading to the chess piece door to proceed. Of course, we witness Ben being wiped out by Birkin first, so I guess that's the same in Leon A and Leon B, but now we have to deal with Birkin and Mr. X running around. Also, while playing this, my mind is constantly bombarded with thoughts about how these things will play out in Resident Evil 2 Remake. It's such a funny way to play such an old game for the first time. Everything you're experiencing knowing will be told to you in a different way in a modern remake later down the line. At the time this game came out, I can't imagine anyone thought games would get any better than this. This was probably mind-blowing at the time. From Birkin as the monster, to Mr. X, Ben's death, Leon's relationship with Ada, or Sherry's involvement in the story, it's something to look forward to as I slowly make my way through the franchise. Also, after hearing Ben's conspiracy, I gotta give Leon some more credit. Claire radios Leon to note that they're heading out through the sewers, and when she completely ignores his pleas to wait, he actually comments on it on his side, stating, Claire! Claire! Wait, wait! Man, why doesn't anyone ever listen to me? This is the first time I've seen him acknowledge how everyone ignores him, and Leon needed that redeeming moment in my eyes. I still think he's a bit of a dweeb, don't get me wrong, but this self-awareness is the character development he needs for me to take him a little bit more seriously. His realization that everyone is treating him wrong but still doing the right thing makes it seem less like he's stumbling around aimlessly, and more like he's ignoring the distractions and attempting to mediate the situation in the station. He understands what the bigger picture is here, and that's something we can all respect. At the chess piece door, we actually fight a mutation of Birkin instead of the deranged G-Virus monster in Leon A. Last time I gunned the creature down with a submachine gun, and this time I scare Birkin off with my shotgun, the monster jumping into the abyss out of fear once we're done with him. Pretty uneventful, all things considered, but it's cool to witness Birkin in a form we haven't seen yet in either playthrough. Leon yells at Ada as she drops through the ceiling, nothing we haven't witnessed before, and they enter the sewers only to get shot at by a net just like last time. Leon does his heroic sacrifice sacrifice to save his lover, and I missed it last time, but Ada says, That woman was... I have to talk to her. Before rushing off, which leads me to believe she knew who Annette was ahead of time, hence her urgency and willingness to run after her and leave Leon on the ground. We take over Ada as she pursues, who can actually be stunned by the cockroaches. I didn't realize this. I thought only Sherry could get stunned because she's so small, and approach Mrs. Birkin to converse. Immediately, my theory that Ada knew who Annette was is ruined, as she directly asks, How did you know? Who are you? After Annette reveals she knows Ada is a spy. So why did she say that woman was then acting as if she knew who she was? I truly have no idea, but I don't have much time to think about it. Annette notes that John, Ada's boyfriend, was turned into a zombie, which can't be great for her to hear, before pointing at Sherry's medallion. This is a welcome twist, as last time Annette recounted how her husband turned into the monster via that cutscene. This time we're seeing a different scene play out. The two of them fight and Ada decks Annette off the railing once again. But then she examines the amulet. Is that a G-Virus sample that Annette has on her before it gets crushed in Claire A? If so, that means she somehow gets this medallion back from Ada sometime before we explore the underground lab. So I'm curious to see how this plays out. Then, in one of the most awkward transitions I've ever seen, Ada walks into the area where the gator appears and just stops. And we gain control of Leon once again. I don't know what that was about, but I'm hoping we'll find out. I initially thought I might find out in Claire's B scenario, but then I remembered that Leon A and Claire B exist entirely separately from Claire A and Leon B. So if we don't find out now, I'll never know, and that's gonna bother me. Running through the spiders, we approach the bridge that requires the valve handle, only to realize that I forgot it while thinking about Ada and Annette and all of that weird stuff that just happened. On my way back to grab it, I attempt to go back the way Claire comes in just for fun, and it's actually open. There's zombies in the long hallway where Sherry gets sucked up, I can walk under the area where Claire radioed Leon as Birkin walks by, we can head up to where Irons died and see 
see him for the only time in Leon's entire campaign, cross through the door to Doom and enter through the back area of Iron's office. This is awesome. And it makes chronological sense too, as Claire's recent radio to Leon takes place right after the Iron situation where he's attacked by Birkin and attempts to kill Claire. Anyways, back to my actual mission. Within the item box, I grab the valve handle and contemplate putting away the Magnum bullets to have an extra inventory slot, but decide against it as I'm likely to come across that gun soon, right? With the valve handle finally in hand, we enter the tunnel that preludes the gator and cautiously approach to find no gator at all. Maybe Claire took it out already? That explosive container is gone, but you'd think the gator body would still be there, so who knows for sure. I wonder if in 2 Remake we'll see bodies and other correlations between opposing characters A and B scenarios. We enter the gator spawning room to find Ada standing there. In Leon A, when playing as Ada at this point, she comes down this ladder, we hear a big splash, and Ada screams as the screen fades to black. This doesn't happen in Leon B, and I want to know why it just cuts with Ada standing there. We experience the same moment where Ada cleans up Leon's wound, so it's just strange that the beforehand is different here, but uneventful at the same time. Like, what was the point of making it different if you're not going to introduce something new? But I digress. From here, we grab the Eagle Medal in the sewer manager's diary and navigate to the waterfall door to move onward and activate the tram. We watch Ada get clapped by Birkin while I beat him with just my pistol, light off the flare for a weapon box key, and grab the shotgun parts just like in Leon's A scenario before arriving in a control room. Now here's where things get a little strange. The big tram elevator that's usually here is no longer. Instead, there's a mini elevator that takes me down to some sort of surveillance room. We turn the corner and find a control panel key that I assume we'll use back upstairs, then look through a monitor to see Mr. X walking along the corridor I just came through. This isn't fair. How the hell did he fit down that small elevator? I try sneaking past him, but this fails miserably as Mr. X pounds Leon relentlessly. <sighs> We finally get around as he winds up a punch, as is usually the case, and sprint back to the control room where Ada is in fear. The key activates the tram elevator, and down we go. Then, as if Mr. X wasn't enough, the Birkin monster appears for Ada's second clapping on a tram in the past 10 minutes, and Leon heads out like the true problem solver he is, with a trusty shotgun, only to also get absolutely pounded. <laughs> Like, look at this brutality. I can't even move for a short while due to these attacks. Not only this, but Leon's upgraded shotgun has much more force, so each shot stuns him in place, with its kickback leaving him much more susceptible to damage. After almost dying to Birkin and his terrifying jump attacks where he lands behind me mid-shot, we fend him off and he grabs hold of the wall while blood pours down from his behind. A satisfying victory, no doubt, and one that's truly tested my proficiency as Leon in this game. I guess that's what Leon's V scenario is for, right? to test my skills and knowledge. Well, consider them tested. This encounter is also pretty neat because we're seeing Birkin transformations that we didn't see in either A scenario. The tram stops and a warning comes on, noting that the motor has been stopped due to problems with overheating. Does this mean we didn't make it to the lab this time? Ada awakens and Leon advises that she remain here while he goes to look for help. She denies him and Leon goes, Is it just me or does everybody always ignore what I say? I told you, it's my job to look after you. Ha! Go Leon! That's the type of self-development we need to see. It's also just a savage line. Ada then goes on her manipulative rant about how she really enjoys Leon and needs him, or maybe she actually feels that way, I don't know anymore. Someone in the comments of my previous video stated that she might just be using him, but I don't know. She's in a pretty dire situation and might die. She also knows that her boyfriend is dead thanks to Annette. So what would she gain by trying to use Leon now? I'm sure we'll find out more about the relationship in the later games and later in the scenario. As Leon and I exit the tram, we're certainly not in the underground lab. Instead, we seem to be in some intermediary section in the elevator shaft 
as a whole. The only way forward is through a ventilation shaft, and right when Leon crawls through it, the elevator, with Ada on it, continues downward. She can handle herself, right? I wonder if it finally moved due to the elevator cooling down, or if Ada was able to do this on purpose somehow. Also, remember that Ada has the medallion that Annette supposedly reacquires, so maybe this is when that happens. All of that aside, Leon finds himself in what the map calls B1 of the laboratory, which seems to be a maintenance area that only engineers and other smart people should be in. And here we find the first and potentially only unique note of Leon's B playthrough, an investigative report on P epsilon gas. Now here's something interesting. The note reads that the P epsilon gas has proven to weaken the BOW cellular functions. BOW stands for bioorganic weapon, by the way. However, prolonged exposures will result in the creation of adaptive antibodies to the agent. Furthermore, some species have been observed to absorb the P epsilon gas as a source of nutrition and will use the toxins extracted against anything that is a threat. Use of the P epsilon gas should be severely limited to extreme cases only. We haven't gotten to this part yet, but those plant monsters that roam the area a little deeper into the lab, they shoot poison in Leon B since I activated the anti-BOW gas in Claire A. Apparently, when you activate the gas in an A scenario, it weakens the plant enemies for the rest of that scenario. But when it comes to the B scenario, those plants can now shoot poison at you. Just as the note says, the gas weakens a BOW at first, but extended exposure enables the creature to use those toxins against any threats. Guess what, Leon? You're a threat. This is something you will not learn by yourself until you play the B scenario. And that's a dirty little trick by Capcom, a consequence for your actions. You may have noticed Leon pushing a box in the background of my discussing that. It's used for getting up to this ledge with a door to the power room. Something to note for later as it's locked right now. But I really hope that the crate remains there when I come back to this room so all of that pushing wasn't a waste of effort. In some of the other rooms, like the puzzle rooms, the boxes reset after you leave and come back. I guess that's for solving a puzzle, but is this considered a puzzle too? I guess we'll know when we come back. We then find a nearby elevator that leads down to yet another set of hallways with two green-skinned, heavily clawed liquors that take quite a few upgraded shotgun shots to mow down. We find an iron smelting pool that may or may not come into play later, and find a switch that activates what's called an A2 elevator, which I'm assuming is the elevator everyone used to navigate the various floors of this massive underground lab when things were going normally. One section of this elevator requires a master key, so that's probably what I'm going to find down here in Leon's B scenario. I step outside the elevator into the area where the tram lowered, next to the safe room where Aiden and Leon had that terrible conversation in his previous scenario. If I remember correctly, this door is locked in both A scenarios, and this is the first time we see what it's used for, so that's actually pretty neat. What isn't so neat is this big set of seemingly mummified zombies crowding the area. I've got a love interest to find, leave me alone. From here we check out the lowered tram to find Ada, but as one would expect, she has disappeared. And Leon asks, Ada, where did she go? He receives no answer. The safe room itself is locked, also requiring the master key, so she can't be in there either. I'm still thinking that wherever she's gone is how Annette receives the medallion back. Leon and I enter the west wing of the underground lab to find more of these skin-stripped monstrosities in the anti-BOW gas room. And before I can even fire, Boy Wonder is eliminated completely. This second death is due in part to my lack of inventory management management and failing to keep some heals on me at all times, and also part because I haven't found any heals in the underground lab so far, and I was keeping an eye out. I took some significant damage from those green liquors earlier, but I shrugged it off assuming there would be some green herbs in this new segment of the game, but I was wrong. That assumption caught up to me and Leon paid the price. After reloading a save that I made right after that part with the liquors, I make a pit stop at the item box for a green herb and feel much better prepared for what's to come. I make my way back to that main area at full health and start at the west wing this time for a bit of a change. We grab the main fuse from that snowed over room, though we require a keycard to explore the rest of this side of things. A keycard that I saw right before Leon's untimely demise earlier, and it looks like I'm facing that situation again much sooner than I expected. I input the main fuse on my way there and bring out a shotgun because I'm not taking any chances this time. We mow down the zombies and find that the vent plant monster has actually already been eliminated, all thanks to Claire I assume. I also can't activate the anti-BOW gas because she already did as well as we discussed earlier. Or I guess I already did it as well 
since I was the one playing as her. Holy shit, there are two more green liquors in the next room that I was not ready for. Either way, we got what we came for and head out to open the West Wing shutters, only to reveal mutated versions of the plant monsters from our A scenarios, again, that I discussed earlier. These guys are definitely upgraded as they immediately shoot poison at us instead of just attacking with melee. Too bad for them though, there are a ton of blue herbs in the anti-BOW room, so who's really winning here? That said, I'm not ready to head down the ladder into the lab's lower floors, so I move back to the east wing, get poisoned once again in the vaccine synthesis room while finding nothing of value, so that was a waste of time, and then open the shutter doors to that fingerprint locked door that guests are able to open upon signing in. Thing is, I need to register Leon's fingerprint in that moth infested room, so I guess I'm heading down the massive ladder after all. On the way I'm poisoned once again, but this turns out to be a blessing in disguise. I stop by the BOW room to cure it and check some lockers out of desperation and find a flamethrower of all things. I can't hold it right now because of the magnum rounds taking up a slot, but I haven't found that weapon yet, so it's time I swap them out. I also find some green herbs I totally missed on this platform last time though, so that's a win if I've ever had one. Down this long ladder are three more green liquors. I said this B scenario would challenge me, didn't I? But there's also some additional herbs I'll keep for later. In the C2 laboratory where Claire sees Leon in the monitor in her scenario, I clear some inventory slots, grab the flamethrower upstairs, and absolutely annihilate a plant monster which somehow used 14% of my available ammunition even though I fired it for like a second, but what are you gonna do? I then kill the giant moth with some shotgun shells, which might be overkill, but hey. I deserve this cathartic moment. I also don't even know if this moth needs to die. Like, does it attack me if I don't kill it? Probably, but I did this just to be safe. Maybe I'll test out not killing it in Claire B. Anyways, Leon enters his guest information and gets his fingerprint registered as we check out the nearby P4 lab. This place is packed with zombies that we very successfully use the flamethrower to burn up. Further in the room, we find the power room key, which, if I'm not mistaken, is for that locked room in the in-between area where the tram elevator got stuck. A good find indeed. Back upstairs, we activate the east wing fingerprint door and find even more green liquors. Even worse, they come at Leon in sequence, making it much harder to fend them all off. While fighting the one in front, the other two come around the corner mid-shot and get in some cheap hits, and I run out of shotgun shells mid-fight, which is not ideal at all. To compensate for this, I go a bit overkill and switch to the flamethrower. It's not like I was going to use my pistol for these things. And what do I earn for my efforts? The submachine gun. No way. So if I did end up grabbing the submachine gun upstairs, I wonder if this would have been additional ammo for it, or maybe a new gun entirely, forcing me to dispose of the old one if I hadn't gotten rid of it by now. There's all sorts of experimented on life forms in here too, and a smash test tube hints at a test subject that absolutely escaped and did some damage. This couldn't be Birkin, as we already know how he transformed, but could it be that random G virus eye monster that our heroes fight in their A scenarios? Regardless of what it is, we clear some inventory space to grab that submachine gun and move forward. On our way to the power room, Leon is shot at from behind yet again, though this time it's from Annette. She's holding the G virus, so she must have found Ada? Or maybe there are multiple copies of the G virus and Ada's version carries on into the later games, meaning it spreads elsewhere. Oh wait, she asked where Ada is, so I guess she didn't find her, so there has to be multiple samples, right? I really hope I find the answers to these questions. Otherwise, the two have the same conversation about Ada being a spy and Leon saying, That can't be. I know her. Even though he doesn't at all. I'm a little sad about this because like the gun shop owner in Claire A, I think this could have been a good opportunity for some new dialogue. However, we do experience a new, more shocking sequence of events. Instead of the ceiling collapsing onto Annette and killing her before she can shoot Leon, our friend Mr. X drops in between them to intermediate and Mrs. Birkin runs off. I run after her to try and juke out Mr. X, but he isn't phased at all. Mans gets a smash in on Leon as we run around him, leaving us in even more pain than when we entered this room, and we're desperately trying to find heals. Maybe in the power room we'll find some? We enter the power room easily because the box does end up staying there, but of course there aren't any heals. Instead of health, we get Mr. X once again and he corners us. <laughs> and 
and just when all hope seems lost, a gunshot out of nowhere distracts the massive monster. Suddenly, Ada yells, run, and unloads her pistol into Mr. X. But as she's reloading, he picks her up, though this just gives her a better angle on his face, which she takes great advantage of, and this is an awesome moment. Mr. X's face is dripping blood, and he smashes through the railing into that smelting pool from earlier, and here I am wishing there was more of a final confrontation with him. Not that Ada's finishing of the monster wasn't incredibly satisfying, but it would have been cool to have a more climactic fight. Ada's victory came at what might be her life, but how am I supposed to care when the following conversation is what's had? Leon, please, uh. escape. No, we're a team. I can't just leave you behind. I'm just a woman who fell in love with you. Nothing more. Y'all are in love. Really. And then they kiss right before she dies, and Leon lets out a genuinely unsettling Ada! And as convincing as that was, I really can't feel sorry for this dude right now. I know these games are more about the survival horror gameplay aspects, and you're not really supposed to pay attention to these story moments too deeply, but I'd be lying to y'all if I said this melodrama isn't making me laugh. But more importantly, Ada still has the medallion on as she dies. Does this confirm that there are more samples? It might. She also dropped the master key so that I can progress further. Oh, and Mr. X smashing Ada into this control panel has started the lab's self-destruct sequence, and I was right. I said in Claire A that we'd find out why this sequence randomly started in Leon's B scenario, and that we did. It's at around this time in Claire A when Annette was killed by her husband and confided in Claire her final words to Sherry, while also providing her with the antidote for Sherry's G-virus infection, as the self-destruct sequence happens right after Annette dies. So really, a lot is happening at once, and as Leon leaves the room, it cuts to Mr. X's hand appearing ominously out of the fire pit. Now that is terrifying. Claire radios in when we get to the other side of the door, and this is where he's standing when she sees Leon on the monitor. How neat to finally see where that is in person. Of course, she asks us to grab Sherry and bring her to the escape tram since Claire has a few other tasks to finish. We head down the elevator to grab Sherry in the safe room, and Leon just places her on the elevator floor, which doesn't seem very sanitary, but whatever. He makes up for it by placing Sherry in a bed on the escape train, but we quickly find that there's no power running to it, and that's a problem. After some exploring, a five minute countdown suddenly appears upon entering a nearby area. I obviously have no idea what to do right now, so I'm freaking out a bit, and Leon still needs a green herb. We come across a pair of high capacity plugs and follow the nearby arrows through a metal door. The area starts shaking, and we see some fire shoot out from the pits below, which I'm not a fan of as I know what's lurking around down there. Leon inserts the plugs, and the lights suddenly dim. Mr. Kennedy turns to see a flaming Mr. X drop from the ceiling, his insanely buff, human looking legs drawing a fair amount of attention. Leaving no time to react, Mr. X charges Leon with a brutal claw attack and continues to wail on him with a way faster attack speed than anything we've seen him hit with so far. I get a few submachine gun shots off, but none that hit, and Leon is absolutely gutted by his newfound nemesis. Now this is the Mr. X I was expecting. I try this fight three or four more times and make absolutely no progress. Mr. X is way too fast, and Leon is only at yellow health with no heals, so there's little to no survivability when this fight starts. I attempted to walk slowly and keep him at arm's length, and while this keeps Mr. X from charging and hitting Leon, we can't turn to do any damage, so it's kind of pointless. I did want a challenge though, so it's time to rethink my strategy. There is another option here. I have a save from back in the underground lab, which I reload to roam around and grab all of the green herbs littered everywhere. Also, if you haven't noticed by now, I totally missed the magnum. I looked up where to find it, as I figured it would be pretty useful, and learned it very much would be, but unfortunately the weapon is stuck back in the star's office, and I completely missed it. In fact, I even said there's nothing new in that room at all. So I'm stuck with some combination of the submachine gun, the pistol, the shotgun, and the flamethrower. I also may have died once or twice to the liquors in the submachine gun room, as my save took place before I entered it, and this forced 
forced me to restart and clear it without taking any damage so I could keep my health up, but we're not going to talk about those mistakes. I also read online that you can fight off Mr. X in the hallway sections to gather some valuable items, so I try it in the hallway where Net shoots Leon, and it works. Mr. X falls to the ground and drops magnum bullets. I swear this game is trying to troll me. Anyways, after multiple attempts, I make it through the liquors without taking damage, avoid Mr. X in this hallway perfectly, go through the Ada section for the master key, and am ready for the final fight with two green herbs, a red and green mixed herb, my flamethrower, and my submachine gun. Let's do this. Before entering, I realize I have to grab both plugs here, I can't just grab one at a time, so I have to use a green herb to open up some inventory space. That's annoying, but I should be fine in the long run. Leon inserts the plugs and the lights suddenly dim, which is a little ironic considering we're meant to restore the power. The fight begins. Mr. X hits me three times before I can even aim, but I unload some submachine gun shots into his frame. I also learn I can survive many more hits when starting this fight at full health. Who would have thought that? At close to three minutes left before complete destruction, a black figure appears above us. Here, use this! The figure says as it tosses us a rocket launcher while sounding suspiciously like Ada, but there's no time to figure out if it's her right now. We pick it up and hopefully I can hit the bastard since I'm out of heals, and I completely miss the first shot as Mr. X guts Leon once again, but he isn't so lucky the second time around. Just like in the first game, we're rewarded with three camera angles of the rocket flying into the beast, the third resulting in Mr. X's body exploding into pieces. As Mr. Sakurai says, <laughs> There's little time to celebrate, however, as the place is still set to explode in two minutes. We rush back to the train only to find it surrounded by zombies, nothing my machine gun can't handle but still annoying. We open the gates, turn on the train, and once again see Claire rush onto the train at the last moment. Sherry is restored. This is just the beginning. And all is well. Wait, the cutscene isn't over. Leon walks to the front of the train, says goodbye Ada, and suddenly it starts shaking. We gain control of Leon once again, and an announcement warns of a potential biohazard outbreak and sets the train to self-destruct in two minutes? Leon and I enter the backside to investigate, but we're quickly surrounded by what must be Birkin's actual final form. A giant, disgusting mouth with tentacles and obnoxious amounts of teeth. Like anyone would do if faced with such a freak, I back Leon into a corner and unload with the submachine gun in what might truly be his most badass moment. Thankfully this works and Birkin collapses into the sludge that he is, though I wouldn't be surprised if he somehow comes back in a future title. Leon is trapped outside and the beast is still alive. It's your dad, bro. Birkin breaks through the door and we cut to Leon on top of the train, while Sherry crawls through a vent into the locked control room to try and stop the train. As Leon tells Sherry what to hit, Claire is suddenly under the train, and the entire thing screeches to a halt as all three party members run off. The countdown hits zero, and Birkin explodes into an amalgamation of fire. He better not be coming back from that. Now Claire says, It's finally over. Even though she countered Leon saying that less than five minutes ago, only to tell Sherry, you look terrible, which is kind of mean, but also hilarious, and yet another terrible set of interactions plays out. I'll just let it roll. Come on, time to leave. Now? What's wrong? Is something following us? We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. Okay, that last line was pretty sick, but otherwise... Claire is shocked that Leon wants to leave? It's so strange to see her being the urgent one in the A scenario endings, and suddenly it swaps to Leon being urgent in the B scenario. It's like she straight up forgot what just happened. I imagine this awkwardness is a case of bad English translation more than it is anything else, but oh boy, this was an awkward cutscene in a beautifully retro way. Dialogue and conversation were often weird in the era of the PS1, but we did it. Leon B is finished, and hmm. 
I'm really struggling with how I feel about this game, guys. I'm a fan of Claire's A scenario due to the story, weapons, gameplay elements, and her as a character overall. And while this scenario helped me appreciate Leon a little more, and while the final fight with Mr. X and the extra twist ending were awesome, I'm just not connecting with this game in the ways that I thought I would. I was bursting at the seams with praise for Remake and its design decisions, atmosphere, location, and more. But with the classic Resident Evil 2, I'm struck with the feeling of good at best? I miss the item combining and puzzle solving of the first game, at least in the form of the first game's remake, and a lot of that seems lost here. Is there ever a point where I'm combining items together to solve a puzzle? This leads me to wonder if Remake is really that different from the original, and if my love of that game is affecting how I feel here? One could also argue in the game's favor that I still think it's a good game, not an excellent game, even though it came out in 1998 and it's 2022. Let's be honest, there's a lot of games from back then that I certainly certainly wouldn't call good today. I also can't take Leon seriously at all, even if his B scenario moment showed a little self-awareness. Say what you will about that, but my lack of being able to take him serious is really ruining things for me. It's weird. Moments like Mr. X's arrival and his subsequent chases scared the shit out of me, so it's not like the game isn't evoking any emotion. But I would absolutely be lying if I said I felt this game stands the test of time. I'm just not understanding all the hype of this alleged classic. But at the same time, my coverage is about playing through games from long ago and looking at them with a the modern eye. It's just weird to go so in depth and spend so much time with the game only to come out and say, yeah, it's all right. And I don't think it's just because this is an older game either. I've loved many older games that I've played in modern times. In October of last year, I played the original Castlevania and loved it. I'm replaying the classic Ape Escape and I'm a massive fan. And I'm currently playing through Final Fantasy IV for the first time and I'm falling in love with that. It's impossible for me to replicate the feelings you all felt when playing Resident Evil 2 upon its release because I just wasn't there. Maybe I just need to accept that. But to help figure out my feelings, I'm going to play and review Resident Evil Director's Cut and compare it to RE2, so at the very least, I have a full understanding of the jump between RE1 and RE2 Classic. Even if it doesn't make me love Resident Evil 2, I will at least have a full picture before moving forward with the series. I should make it clear that I still very much respect this game for all it did, and I hope that's coming through in these videos. I'm having a really fun time breaking down everything there is to know about the game, all of the ties to the various scenarios, how it changes as you keep playing, and all that stuff. But that's where the fun is for me when it comes to this game. I'm not not having fun while playing Resident Evil 2, but the love that I shared for Remake really isn't there for RE2. Like I said, there's no denying how big an influential RE2 was, and you can respect a game without being head over heels for it. That said, my just fine feelings towards this game make me all the more hyped to play Resident Evil 2 Remake, as maybe the modern twist on things will help me appreciate everything a little more. As always, I'm going to be ending this video by going over some reader comments on the previous one. But before that, thank you all for watching. Please let me know what you think of the game in the comments below. Tell me what it was like at release and why you love it so much. Or maybe why you don't love it so much. And don't forget to subscribe to stay updated on all of my upcoming videos. Did you know when Birkin bursts through the ceiling while waiting for the elevator, you can actually spam four shots with either character before the game gives you control back? It's a helpful tool to get four free hits in before the fight begins, especially on a harder difficulty. No, I actually did not know this, and I said I was going to try this in the B scenarios, but obviously I didn't have to fight him in that room, so maybe I'll try again if I ever do another A scenario playthrough. The door at 2423 is actually the same door that you see at 934 just from the other side. For many years, a lot of RE fans couldn't figure it out and thought it was a secret area that they couldn't get access to. Ha ha ha. This is very good to know. Of course, Jake Stone is referencing the door by the statues that you push around to get one of the first red gems for Tyrannos. That is really good to know. Thank you so much. Honestly, a cool little Easter egg. I'm so happy you're experiencing all this for the first time. Thank you for sharing your thoughts in this format. You must understand that a lot of people know this game and series inside out. The thought of experiencing these classic titles again for the first time makes me unbelievably nostalgic. Absolutely, I'm more than happy to provide. Thank you so much for watching.